right. John dropping <laughs> so like that should happen. He was on at that point. Okay. Can, oh, I can hear me now. All right. We're back on. Okay. I'll try that again. <laughs> All right. We are going to start the meeting. This is the uh, regular City Council meeting. It is March 9th. It is 7.30. Clerk, can you please take a roll call? Yes. Councilman Bliss? I'm here. Uh, Councilwoman Clark? Here. Councilman Corbett? Here. Uh, Mayor Pertem Grafstein? Here. Councilor Rohrbach? Here. Councilman Soltis? Here. Mayor Hartwell? Okay, can I get a motion to excuse Mayor Hartwell, please? He did give advance notice. Pro tem. Yes. I'll make a motion to excuse uh, Mayor Hartwell. Great, thank you. Does anyone want to make a second? Got it. Yes. Support. Great, we have a motion and a second to excuse Mayor Hartwell. Uh, is there any discussion? All right, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The motion passes. Um, can everybody please rise if you are able for an invocation by Councilman Corbett. And please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Infinite wisdom, we thank you for having given us the opportunity to meet together here today, and we ask most humbly for a blessing of our gathering. Brighten our eyes with greater understanding, enrich our hearts with compassion and courage, and again receive our gratitude for this opportunity of fellowship. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and okay, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Mr. Governor. Mr. Bliss? Uh, I move that we add to the agenda under uh, C1, uh, Fire Department, the emergency purchase of the aeroclave decontaminating unit. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Madam Mayor. Support. Thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second to add to the agenda um, for the fire department an emergency purchase of an aeroclave decontaminating unit. Is there any discussion? All right, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion carries. Great. All right. Uh, public hearings, there are none. So next up is meeting open to the public. There's any members of the public who would like to come and address council, this is the time to do it. Please keep your comments to three minutes and please provide your name and address for the record. Meeting's open to the public. Good evening, council. Is this one on too? Yeah, you're yes. Good. You're good. Um, I jumped up first because uh, the lady I brought with me tonight needs to get back home near the Lansing area, so we want to get her out of here. Uh, my name is Vita Palazzolo, 27074 in Nanton, and um, uh, I'm here tonight to um, share a little bit about uh, Multiple Scler Sclerosis Awareness Month, which is March, and um, I put a post out on Facebook and um, to let people know I was bringing the president of the Michigan chapter of the National uh, MS Society. Uh, it's one of those days where I'm struggling with words and, um, and dry mouth from my medications. Um, all part of the wonderful world of MS. Um, but uh, when I put my post out on Facebook, um, on a couple of the uh, Madison pages and on my personal page, it just, it broke my heart to have seven responses come from just Madison Heights that either have MS or have a family member with MS. Counting myself, that's you know about seven of us, eight of us, um, and that's eight too many. Uh, what do we do? Um, we um, we thank God for research and development and um, fundraising and things like. Uh, Awareness Month, and we also thank God for the MS Society that offers um, so much help for us. And I'm going to bring my friend Tammy Willis up here right now and let her share a little bit about what they do so we can be quick done out of here 
and let you roll. Thank you for everybody that wore orange and everybody back there, you know, that's supporting MS3 that has it, you know, rock on warriors, because, uh, you know, there you go. So, Tammy Willis. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. As Vita said, my name is Tammy Willis, and I'm the president of the National MS Society here in Michigan. And she talked about the number of people here in the city, but unfortunately, Michigan has the dubious honor of being, having one of the highest incidence rates of MS in the entire country. So it's not uncommon that I hear stories like that. Um, I do want to thank those of you who are wearing orange tonight, and also thank you for the impact that you have on the MS community in general. Your support, along with the MS Society, has helped to pave the way for every single treatment option that's available for people today with MS, and we're the catalyst for all major advances in the disease. There's more potential treatments and trials than at any other time in history, and the promise of myelin repair is actually now a reality, and we can start to understand the cause of MS, with almost 200 genetic variants having been identified and risk factors con confirmed. The NMS Society has built a network of resources thanks to people like Vita and a supportive of community for people affected by the disease. We know that individuals who participate in programs provided by the National MS Society live better lives. They report feeling less isolated and better informed. The National MS Society exists to make sure that no one faces MS alone. We're determined to be lifelong partners and a resource for people affected by the disease while we aggressively investigate the research that matters most. In Michigan, 100% of the people that are affected by multiple sclerosis have access to an MS navigator. It's a partner for them to address their individual challenges and concerns. Just as we work together so that every person can find their strength and power in their own individual MS jersey, we raise our voices collectively and shape the decisions that affect all of us. Last week, more than 300 district activist leaders met in Washington, D.C. to share their insights on public health policies. We believe that everyone deserves affordable medications, a doctor that knows MS, and a health care system that puts them first. No one should have to choose between paying their bills and getting the care and medications they need to manage their disease. However, I'm saddened to share that over 40% of the people report altering or stopping their MS treatment because of cost. Last year, it was activists at the Society's Public Policy Conference who took the information from a landmark study that there's now nearly a million people living with MS in the United States. It's almost twice what we previously estimated. So they went to Capitol Hill, they shared that information in their stories. Eight to 10% of these one million people are children who are under the age of 18, and 70,000 of them are veterans. And as I shared, here in Michigan, we have over 18,000 people, one of the highest states. I'm pleased to report that the activists turned their power and passion into results and received a $10 million increase in the MS research program through the Department of Defense and $3 billion increase in the National Institute of Health Research funding. Last week, these same activists asked cities, just like Madison Heights, to consider those with disabilities when planning for disasters, asking questions like, are shelters accessible to people who are in wheelchairs? Are there adequate generators and refrigerators to store disease-modifying medications? And are there places to charge electric wheelchairs so people can continue to get around? The National MS Society makes sure that the voices of people are heard loud and clear, and we're their champions from the halls of Congress to city halls just like this. We've never been closer to a cure, to understanding how to prevent the disease and reverse its course, to finding treatments for progressive MS that are as effective for those discovered for relapsing MS, to bringing life-changing solutions and treatments to everyone with this disease. We've achieved more breakthroughs in MS than any other neurological disease, and even more transformative breakthroughs are within our reach. We're on the brink that we've been working toward in our entire 75 years. A breakthrough that will change MS and go down in history is the one that helped end the disease forever. In this new chapter in the MS movement, we ask for your support 
And it's through organizations like yours and communities like Madison Heights that will help pave the way and eventually help us achieve our vision, which is a world changed for people affected by MS. I want to thank you for your partnership to get us to this moment. The next chapter in our story could be the last chapter of MS. And I hope the next time I'm back here to address you, it will be that I'm able to say that we actually have a cure for this disease. Thank you so much and good night. Thank you. If you have something to give, if you give it to me, please, as the chair, I can I can pass out to everyone. That is for Mr. Mayor. I will bring it up against this. Orange tie. And then whoever's left the knows just get back to me, and okay. everybody gets it back. Okay. Thank you. So, thank, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for everyone who, uh, again, who wore orange and who is supporting uh, this community. The meeting is still open to the public. If there's anyone who'd like to speak. Your Honor, just really quick before you move on. Uh, could we add a proclamation uh, declaring MS Awareness Month onto the next meeting's agenda and then get that publicized on social media? Sure. I think that's, that's a good idea. Hi. Good evening, and I'm sorry I'm just walked in late. I didn't hear what all uh, Vita had to discuss. Um, but I've been recently diagnosed of having MS. And it was said that it took almost four years for the doctors to really figure it out. Um, but because I had a MRI dam, that's the thing that determined that I had MS. I didn't have any motor skills issues or anything like that. But to my surprise, my pastor and I went online looking for an MS support group. We do not have one here in Madison Heights. The nearest one is in Far West Warren, Sterling Heights, Southfield, and also West Bloomfield. Nope, not West Bloomfield, Birmingham. And uh, Vita and I was talking last week about trying to get a support group here in, Mich uh, in Madison Heights. Because I didn't really realize when a person is diagnosed with a certain disease or issues, they feel that they're by themselves. No one else has this illness but them. But as we start talking about the marijuana and different people need the medication for their pain, because I have good insurance from General Motors, because I retired from GM after 30 years. My medication, I don't have to pay anything for it. But the cost of what they told me that it would be each month, if I didn't have insurance, I wouldn't be able to afford it. So many people, by the time they are diagnosed of having MS, they're so far gone in their illness that a lot of medications does not help them. I'm able, to, I was fortunate to be diagnosed early enough where I can take medication to help keep it at bay. But it's gonna be a lifestyle that I have to live with from now on. So many people across this nation fights with a certain illness and others like it, to, it's mind boggling. Um, when my mother was diagnosed with cancer over 20 years ago, my question was, it's not who else have cancer, but who don't. You'd be surprised at the people that are walking around here just looking at everyone. We look healthy and fine, but internally there's huge problems. So uh, we were talking about we're going to have to go more in discussion and try to figure out exactly how we can have forms here in Madison High to give MS support group because people need to tell this, share their stories to know exactly where they are, what to look forward to, and maybe med different medication that might help them. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my name is Liza Lee. <laughs> and, uh, 31 800 Carla Drive. Thank you for sharing that. And if you do set up a support, please, you can get up, but if you do set up a support group, please let the city know, um, and we can help uh, publicize that when you do set that up. You get it? Go ahead. Hello, my name's Gloria Moore, 27368 Dartmouth. Uh, friends of the Madison Heights area, Senior Citizens is having another third Tuesday meeting, March 17th at Wilkinson Middle School. Also, um, we're planning to, uh, we have the money set aside for a, a <coughs> core sampling site for Gunther Street. We still have to get that in motion yet. Also, at, uh, 
at Wilkinson Middle School April 3rd, we're planning a sock hop where uh, senior citizens can bring their grandchildren, the students can bring their grandparents for free, uh, others can come in with a donation, and we have a, a DJ, and the uh, music is of the 1920s up through the 1950s through the 2020s. And, uh, and uh, we'd like to hear from everybody by March 20th, but uh, our food per count for food purchases is March 27th. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to? Uh... Thanks, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Gary McGovern, 926 Tanglewood, also a county commissioner from Mass Knights. Uh, I passed around to the council members a flyer. I'm hosting the spring cleanup at the Red Oaks Nature Center again. That'll be on April, Sunday, April 19th, from 9 to a.m. till noon. Um, lunch will be provided, and um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me, and, and I'll make sure that uh, I can answer your questions. The other item I'm here, I came to just to talk generally over the unfinished business that's on your agenda. <clears throat> and excuse me. I read in the paper that you're talk, thinking about changing it from 500 feet setback to zero. And I would hope that you wouldn't do that. I have a real concern. Setbacks are there for a reason. Um, things may have gotten messed up in this situation. But just the same, I really can't see uh, why council would do that, go all the way to zero. Move it to 400, move it to 300, whatever feet, but, but not to zero. Um, just wanted to pass along my concerns. Thank Thanks. you. Good evening, Pat Shields, resident of Madison Heights. You know I'm here to address the ordinance 2148. <clears throat> this is the city's official map number one. This is the city's official map number two. This is the city's official map number three. We are now going into map number four. I don't trust your official map with its green zone for marijuana facilities. <clears throat> In the city ordinance, it notes marijuana facilities can be established in areas M1 and M2. In looking at the city zoning map, I find that there are seven areas that are listed M1 north of 12 Mile and at least 21 south of 12 Mile. They are not listed on the green zone now. Can this city council guarantee that those areas will never be added to the green zone now or in the future? If you can't, then I urge you to vote no on ordinance 2148 and go back to the drawing board and make the changes necessary to protect the residents on Mark, Longfellow, Gary, and Edgeworth, your neighbors whose property back up to these M1 locations that are shown as uh, gray areas at this time. I don't care if it's 300 feet, 320, 350, or 400 feet. There needs to be some restriction to protect the residents, the schools, the churches, and the other areas. 
and you need to add to the distance, the playgrounds, the soccer complex, and the water park, places where youth gather. You made the error, and now, to save your skin, you're ready to throw the residents under the bus by reducing the distance from 500 feet to nothing, zero. <clears throat> no on ordinance 2148, <clears throat> excuse me, and you should rewrite it to include measured distance so that in the future, the city council or any other city council will not have the authority to make the decision as to what is an adequate distance separating locations from marijuana facilities. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have comments they'd like to make? Yeah, please. Good evening to all. My name is John Ed Egger, former mayor of Kennedy for the city of Madison. I recognize you. Excuse my appearance today, but I had to come in for this meeting. I want to write what my husband, who is not here tonight, wrote on Facebook. He never participated in anything, basically, but he is a man of his word. He indicated the city mishandled one business, allowing it to be within 400 feet of the residents instead of 500 feet. This you have to apply for a variance, not to change the law to zero. Not everyone wants marijuana plant in their backyard. Federally, marijuana is a controlled substance. It's a Schedule One drug for high potential for abuse. I've lived in this city for 20 years. The reason I moved to this city was because this is a city for families. I've worked as a substitute teacher for over 15 years. I'm appalled to see in the paper, CNG newspaper, Marijuana siphon in violation of ordinance. Who decided to allow these plants here within our city or to even think about it? We have families, children. When you go to John R. and Whitcomb, there's a daycare. The entrance faces one of your hydro plan you have allowed in the city, door to door. Little Caesar and Dequindle. What's going on? Our mayor tried to imply that it's okay for the owners of these businesses to have contributed to some elected official account for elections? Is this what's behind this? They contributed. Are you guys, whoever it is, you received their funds, are you in their pockets? Years ago, I indicated that the casino in Detroit was going to take people out of poverty, help the city. The city wasn't bankrupt. All money is not good money. Not everybody smoke marijuana in your city or drink. Or oh, windows in the backyard. Think about five years, ten years from now. What is this city going to look like? What is this city going to look like? It is shameful to see so many negatives regarding money. It's all about the dollars. I'm hoping this council would think and think very hard. There was a councilwoman that served this city for over 24 years. She got to be appalled at what's going on. Think about what you're doing to your city. We all live here. Think about the laws that you want to create. Zero, 
are the owners of these plants living here in our city? Do they have their children attending our schools, <coughs> playing in our soccer fields? These are questions you have to ask yourselves. It is shameful and it is embarrassing. Think, common sense, not filthy money. We keep this city going. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else who would like to comment tonight? Hi there, my name is Amy Prather. I own, I'm a co-owner of a house on Shirley Avenue. The house number is 29490. Sorry, I'm incredibly nervous. I have never been to a meeting like this before. My concern is also ordinance 2148. Our house backs up to DeQuinder and we currently get garbage and all types of things in our backyard from a business that we're not sure is conducting sound business at their establishment. And the police responded to us with that there was nothing they could do because, for the most part, because marijuana was legal now. And we brought to them that the city's restrictions still prohibit them from operating a business like this in there and it should still be investigated. I'm paraphrasing for the most part, but you get my drift. And they made it sound as if it wasn't really a concern to them but this business is suspicious. It's in my backyard. And my worry is, if it's not legal now and they're a suspicious business, what happens when the restriction goes to zero? What happens with my new home where my three children live and this business can operate there legally and now I have marijuana garbage flying into my backyard <coughs> legally? This is a huge concern for me. Anybody, I, I used to live in Hazel Park, and I, I live north of Nine Mile in a very quiet neighborhood, and it was a safe community. And I moved to Madison Heights with the hopes that I would be moving to a safer community, family-oriented community. This, as a new home buyer, this is terrifying, the fact that the city council would just reduce the restriction down to zero. It does not say that you have our family's best interest at heart. It does not say that you want to protect our children, our property values. I don't wanna name call. I don't care if people smoke marijuana in their homes. I don't care if they wanna buy it from a facility in our city. I don't care about any of that. I care about the safety of my family, my property value being maintained because I don't want a marijuana business in my backyard. And I care about the safety of our schools that I pay taxes into. Everything else is whatever people want to do. I'm not here to judge them. I'm not here to call names. I just ask that we keep in mind that those restrictions were put in place to protect families and reducing that to zero is not an appropriate thing. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, I'm Hi. Paul Sanders. I live Sanders. in 26433 Rialto Street. I just came here just because I had a high school teacher say you should come to two meetings a year. <laughs> Always nice to see you, Mr. Sanders. About the marijuana stuff. I live with MS. I have for 25 years known about it. I know what MS can do to a person's body. I really can. I've lived with it. And I know the medications I took trying to save people's lives at both Beaumont and Royal Oak and Beaumont out of them 59. I've been through a lot of stuff at MS University <coughs> of Michigan. And I know the good effects that grass can have. And I know it was legalized. And I know that you're fighting all over where it can be smoked and where it can be drank and where it can be used in this kind of gummy and that kind of gummy and everything else. And I also know that the majority of people, they don't use it. It's legal and they don't want it, they don't like it. There aren't that many people smoking it or using it. It's not gonna be a big problem. And I feel bad for the people that have MS and other problems because I've lived with it. 
Bob Colbert saved my rear end with the medications that they gave me that drove me insane. And I was ready to shoot myself. Oh, and then the doctors finally realized that maybe this medicine was bad and it wasn't grass. There's a lot of people got a lot of problems in this world. And I realize if you don't like grass, don't smoke it. Don't give it to anybody. But don't mess with the people that do. If they're getting too toxic to be driving, call the police. Rat on them, just like you would an alcoholic. They got a problem. They need help. But that's enough of picking on the grass stuff. I came here because I'm really thrilled to death with what you did with the green stuff, the yellow stuff that was oozing on the 696, <laughs> and the problems that you had to go on television to stand up for. Thank you. You're when welcome. You were first running for election, you thought I was mad at you. <laughs> you did really great on television, and I'm proud of what our city did. Thank you. It was horrible what's going out on 696, and yeah. you took it on the chin, standing up for our city. Thank you. Talk about welcome. the green slime that was yellow and turned green once it got to the concrete. It's Thank contained. You. You've done so much to help all of us. You helped save my life. You've been instrumental. All of you people, you're young, you're energetic, and you've done a great job. I've seen what you did when people crashed into your car when you were having breakfast one day. <laughs> you're a good man. Almost all of you are some of the best people I've ever met. If people are doing too much grass, call the police, and the police will take care of it. They need to be able safely to drive and to live their life. We don't need to have people growing 500,000 acres of it. But if the only place you can sell it is within 50 feet of some other building, so what? You've got all these different drug stores are right across from each other in this city. I'm not saying everybody needs every kind of drug in the world. But I'm telling you, most of the marijuana people I know that have smoked, the biggest problem they got is they eat too darn much pizza. <laughs> yeah. So please, I'm going to hush up and sit down. I didn't come here to start problems. If people got a problem smoking grass, they shouldn't. They shouldn't be driving. And nobody wants their backyard completely covered with it, and they're not supposed to be smoking it, and they're not supposed to be growing it outside. If they do it inside, and good Lord, don't grow that skunk weed that stinks so bad. And the people that know what I'm talking about know <laughs> it stinks like skunks. <coughs> please be kind to people. There's people that they're trying all these different drugs with MS and all these other different problems. Let's hope they can come up with something in the next 20, 40, 50 years. <coughs> After I'm gone, you'll be able to look around and say, we finally cured a couple things. And in the meantime, I'll hush up and go sit down. Y'all have a good one. Thank you, Mr. Sanders. It's always nice to see you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Andrew Bowen, 30134 Northeastern Highway. Keep it brief, just two things. Um, I looked, didn't find any proof that kids that live near dispensaries got hooked. And two, walking by those soccer fields in the last two weeks, I saw two different times some gentlemen holding paper bags. So, thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you for keeping it short. Good evening. Good evening, City Council and Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, my name is Mike Bohura, as most of you know. I am one of the owners of this uh, very controversial site all of a sudden on Ajax Drive. And uh, again, I wasn't really planning on speaking, but I just wanted to, to address some of the comments that were made. And I feel like there's some misinformation, maybe some misunderstanding about exactly what's happening as far as the ordinance is concerned. Ye yes, the, the ordinance takes away the separation distances, but it still specifically states that only the parcels shaded in green on the map are the ones that qualify. So for those people that are concerned that the, the parcel may be near their neighborhood or that's abutting their house, just because there's no separation distances, if that parcel is not shaded in green on the map, it's ineligible for a license. And if the city was ever to change their mind and wanted to redo it, you would have to have a, a, you know, a public hearing, uh, a, a second reading, public comments. I'm sure it'd have to go to planning for technical review. It's a long process. 
and plenty of opportunity for people to voice their opposition if that were to happen. I don't suspect that it will, but if that were to happen, that's the process. It's not something that, just because it says no separation distances means that all of a sudden anybody can go open a marijuana shop uh, at any building that's M1 or M2. Um, uh, you know, I, I want to piggyback a little bit on, on what a, a couple of the other people said. Um, you know, I, I know marijuana is, is a little taboo still, and um, you know, but but I would say, were you guys up here talking about the liquor stores and the pharmacies and some of these other thing, uh, other types of businesses that that um, I would argue are much worse for the community than uh, cannabis and what cannabis has done for people in need. Um, and you know, I, I wasn't even gonna say this, but I, I'm gonna bring it up, because I think I was quoted in an article. If people think there was something going on, um, <laughs> nobody from my group ever made a donation or a contribution. We never advocated for any particular parcel to be approved. If that was the case, I would have advocated for the one I already owned at 11 and John R, instead of having to go buy a, a, a parcel that didn't own. So had I had my choice, like some people may insinuate, I would have said, I want it at the corner of 11 and John R that's currently vacant and I've owned for 10 years. That's what would have made most sense. But we didn't advocate for any parcel. We didn't advocate, we didn't come here for public comments. We waited for the city to do what they were gonna do, publish the ordinance, publish the map, and only then did we try to identify a site that needed rehabilitation. <clears throat> so, um, you know, I just wanted to kind of give you guys and the people listening uh, the other side of it. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Hello, Cindy Holder. Good evening. I don't even know where to start. You need a footage. But while Mr. Bahara is speaking from his own point of view, I'm a grandma. I'm here to protect my grandkids, my neighbor's grandkids, your guys' grandkids, and right now, the, without this footage regulation, anyone now sitting, or two years, or five years from now, can say the intent was that this was gonna be okay, and it passed. And I'm here to tell you, quote unquote, pounding on the table, whatever gets someone's attention. Um, we have now at least four grow houses between 20 feet next to Wilkinson Junior High to the corner of John R. and Lincoln. That's not even taken into account with the medical marijuana, and I haven't heard anyone say for a while that we're opposing people that are sick to not get their medical marijuana. What we want is consistency. You guys are the ones that made the mistake. You made the mistake months ago. It was brought to your attention. You did nothing. Even I will say, Mr. Bahara, on, on his defense, you know, I'm sure he did follow the protocol that was set. But you guys knew this before he invested tens of thousands of dollars. At least September, you knew, before the election. I know that you guys are saying, Mr. Bliss, that there's a potential lawsuit if this doesn't pass. Then why not, like Mr. McGilvery suggested, whatever is it, 398 <coughs> feet, let's make it that. If you have to incorporate this particular property to avoid a lawsuit, then let's do that. Why say zero? Why take the footage off the map? Why not give the nurseries where preschool kids are, schools, churches, playgrounds, the soccer field that's excluded, trailer parks where people live and pay taxes, but they weren't included in this safety zone? Why can't we go if you guys are so bent on making this 
property, this square peg fit the round hole. Why can't it be a negotiated whatever that footage is? Why do we need to go to zero? Why do we need to make it ambiguous? Uh, the last thing I guess that I want to say is, the mayor said he's serving two thirds of the population. Actually, you guys are serving all of us, not just two thirds of the people that voted for proposal one. Proposal one not only said it can be um, smoked and, and whatever, there were certain precautions and rules and regulations that you guys were gonna protect the rest of us with. And that was part of the proposal. It wasn't just, it can be used. And so I really think that you need to turn this down, go back to the drawing board. I'm sorry that Mr. Bahara might be sitting swinging, you know, at this, but you guys did this to yourselves. You did it to us and our kids and our neighbors and our community it deserves better. Thank you. Is there anyone else who, yes. <clears throat> Thank you for getting that. Donald Vlasic, 28728 Park Court. I am maybe not going to be the most popular guy here because I am in it for the money. I really, really believe that Madison Heights needs to move forward and get their tax dollars any way they can. We legalized marijuana in the state. We legalized marijuana in the city of Madison Heights. We need these tax dollars to keep our city services, which are spectacular. And we've got great fire service, great police department. Our I don't know of any other town, Lathrop Village, I was a mailman in the city of Southfield, is the only other city that I know of that actually does curbside service on their leaves. I want to keep that. So whatever you have to do to, do to keep these tax dollars rolling, I'm in favor of that. I read in the free press, I believe it was yesterday, that the state in the first three months has collected $31 million in taxes off of legalized marijuana sales. Five million of that is, is is revenue that is going to go to the schools, to roads, and some of that will be refunded to the city of Madison Heights. And that's ab above and beyond what the gentlemen that have opened the two marijuana shops in the city of, of Madison Heights are doing. Somewhere, I believe, and I hope I'm right, it was nearly $25 million that they were going to invest in this city in the, in the next few years. How can we throw that away? I look at the sign, it says Madison Heights, city of progress. I think we need to prove that we are, and I think we just need to move ahead and keep going on with this simply because it's the, well, some people won't say it's the right thing to do, but I certainly believe it is. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Hi, my name is uh, Robert Van Fleet. I'm a new homeowner at 29490 Shirley Avenue um, with Amy. I wasn't really gonna talk, but um, I guess part of what um, Amy kind of brought up, and hopefully a lot of the, the members of the community feel the same way, is that it's not so much anti-marijuana. I don't have a problem with the business being in the city, the tax dollars it's going to generate. Um, there's a lot of positives to it. All that I know Amy and I are concerned with, and I'm sure a lot of other people, is just protections. Moving it to zero, it removes those protections. People talk about the, the designated green zones. Somebody brought up the question, what says in five years it doesn't change? It becomes looser, more areas are added. As homeowners that pay a lot, my tax bill, for my house is going to be almost seven thousand dollars this year it you know what what says that we're going to be protected that our property value is not going to go down because we live it on de quinter and we back up to commercial businesses that's that's 
I know my concern is her concern is just protection for our kids, our eight-year-old, our 11-year-old, our 12-year-old. They don't need to be exposed to that at this age. Let them, as they become adults, make those decisions. The shop that Amy brought up, the smell from it in the middle of the night is horrendous. So we just, that's all we really want is just some protections. Don't, don't just, if you need to do what you need to do to prevent a lawsuit, that's fine, but don't take it to zero. It's, it's not fair to the kids. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone else? We're done. Okay, no one else wants to be recognized. We are going to move on. Thank you everyone for your comments tonight. Uh, next item is communications and we've had an addition to that, item C1. Mrs. Marsh, Fire Department. Yes, so um, this item was added to the agenda tonight for the emergency pur purchase of the aeroclave decontamination unit. Um, this technically does not receive, need council approval. It's for informational purposes only. So I wanted to let the residents know that again, the fire department has, I'm very proud of them. They have been very proactive in the preparation for the case against actually COVID-19, um, which we've all been hearing about on the news. We have had several meetings internally and the fire department has been on top of this. We've had um, several different protocols changed throughout our emergency medical processes. And so based upon these me meetings, the fire chief and the key fire personnel um, asked to purchase a aeroclave decontamination unit for $14,475 dollars, which I approved on Friday. We are able to use a competitive bid from the Houston Galveston Fire Department. This is something that we can utilize throughout the city. We can use it for the um, police department. It's a portable unit, so we can use it to decontaminate our emergency vehicles, as well as the cots, the police department, any office in city hall that may become um, contaminated, not only from this virus, but from many other situations as well. So um, the fire chief is with us tonight. Um, if you want to add a few other things, but um, while he's coming to the podium, I will just say if there's anybody that's concerned that feels that they may be infected, there is a number from the Oakland County Health Department that they can call. They have nurses on call, and the number is 1-800-848-5533. And we also just ask if you can drive yourself to urgent care or the emergency room that you do do that to limit the number of people that you come in contact with. So, uh, Chief, before you say anything, um, Mrs. Marsh, can we put that phone number on our website, please? Yes, thank um, you. Actually, yes, Dave Soltis had pointed it out to me actually okay. before the meeting, so we, we will have it on the okay. website as well. Thank you. Go ahead, Chief. And on cable. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I, I appreciate the city manager. What she said was uh, very important, and uh, she made it very clear what needs to be done. But, you know, when we talk about this uh, emergency purchase, you know, we were looking for the best way, the most efficient way uh, to prevent uh, infectious disease spread. Uh, to our residents and the patients that uh, we transport. Um, as you know, it's, it's becoming very evident that we're gonna have to deal with this COVID-9 um, outbreak and we're trying to prepare as best we can. Um, you know, we wanna be, look at the most uh, assured that our patients and our firefighters are protected. We do not want a Kirtland, Washington where we have to quarantine 25 firefighters. That'd be very devastating to our department and our emergency response. So we wanna try everything we can to limit the spread of this disease. So that's why uh, we appreciate um, the city manager approving it and the council backing her on that decision to purchase this, uh, this piece of equipment. Thank you, Chief. I think I speak for all of council when I say uh, we really appreciate everything that you're doing and being proactive with this. So thank you. Oh, thank you very much. And my, uh, as the manager said, the our, the, my manager. staff. Needs and your staff, credits. you and so, your staff, yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so we do not need to vote on that. So the next item is uh, D, no reports, E, F, F1, purchasing uh, bid awards. Ms. Marsh. 
This is item is for the Community Development Block Grant Funding Yard Service. So in accordance with HUD regulations, an invitation to bid for Community Development Block Grant funded lawn services was posted. A total of 211 vendors were rich via the Minton site. 36 of those vendors actually downloaded the specifications and five bids were submitted to the city. Of the five bids received, the lowest qualified bidder was Zimmerman Lawn and Snow Service at $16 per lot. Madison Heights has used Zimmerman for CD DBG lawn services in 2008 and 2019. City staff and residents alike have found them to be very professional and easy to work with. They also provide excellent services. Staff and I would respectfully request that council award the bid to Zimmerman Lawn and Snow for a one-year contract at a unit price of $16 per lot for the 2020 mowing season. We would also request that council authorize the city to proceed to the next lowest qualified bidder who is Gratiot Landscaping at a unit price of $20 $25 per lot in the event that the contract with Zimmerman is canceled due to non-performance or any other issues. Great, thank you. Uh, what is the wish of council? Mr. Ma Madam Mayor, apologies. Mr. Corbett? Um, yes, I move that the council uh, concur with the recommendation of staff and award the bid, uh, and this is regarding the funded yard service, uh, uh, lawn service to Zimmerman Lawn and Snow for a one-year contract at a unit price of $16 per lot for the 2020 mowing season. Additionally, we would authorize the uh, city to proceed to the lowest, the next lowest qualified bidder, Gratiot Landscaping, at a unit price of $25 per lot in the event the contract with Zimmerman is canceled due to non-performance or any other issue deemed by the Thank administration. You. Thank you. Do we have a second? Your Honor. Second. Thank you. All right, a motion has been made and seconded uh, regarding the purchasing <coughs> coordinator. Uh, is there any discussion? All right, seeing no discussion, let's take a vote. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, say no. Great, motion carries, thank you. All right, uh, next up is ordinance number 2151, request for pilot, Mrs. Marsh. Yes, this is a payment in lieu of taxes for the senior development at 27795 De Quinder, also known as Madison Manor. National Church Residence is proposing to complete several improvements at the existing facility noted, known as Madison Manor at 27795 De Quinder. These improvements are estimated to cost approximately $3 million and include items such as the mill and resurface of the asphalt parking lot, installation of four raised gardens, replacement of peri perimeter fence, new landscaping, maintenance to balconies, in-unit replacement of entry doors, new flooring, updated kitchens, and renovations to meet type a handicap accessible units. The terms of this pilot included would mirror those that we recently approved for Cypress Partners and are conditioned upon City Council approval. These include 4% of total annual shelter rents obtained by Madison Manor during the prior calendar year. This is estimated to be around $21,817 and this would be split between all taxing jurisdictions. An annual $40,250 in an emergency services fee that increases each year by the C CPI, this would be retained by the city. And a lump sum one-time payment of $67,473 for an emergency services payment to offset the cost of emergency medical service runs at the senior living facility, this also would be retained by the city. In fiscal year 2020, National Church residents paid $108,472 in total taxes for this property located at 27795 De Quinder. Of this amount, $40,236 was retained by the city. Under this agreement, and because of the emergency services fee, National Church residents would pay approximately $62,067, and of this amount, $48,342 would be retained by the city. If council approves ordinance 215 one upon first reading, the emergency services fee agreement would be brought to council for consideration on March the 23rd with the second reading of this ordinance. And we have representatives here for um, um, national church residents as well. Okay, thank you. Um, what is the wish of council? Madam Mayor. Mr. Corbett. I move that the uh, council adopt on first reading, yes, uh, ordinance 2151 relative to the emergency services fee agreement between the City of Madison Heights and Madison Manor Senior Facilities. Thank you, is there a second? Your Honor. Mr. Soltis. 
second, please. Great. Thank you. There's been a motion and a second to approve Ordinance 2151. Is there any discussion? Uh, Your Honor. Yes, Mr. Bliss. Uh, um, I'm not 100% sold on this yet. Um, this is only first reading, so it, it will have my vote. Uh, but when we get back to second reading, I'd like to say a little bit more about the jobs that this will create, uh, the benefit to our residents who live there. Uh, is this going to mean additional residents? Is this uh, like I, I see the numbers, and, and the numbers are are absolutely positive for the city <clears throat> in the increased uh, tax revenue and the service fees, but. Uh, what does this mean in, in terms of all of those indirect uh, uh, benefits? Uh, that, that's what I'd like to see. Is there increased jobs? Uh, are these, you know, the, the construction work that's going to be done? Uh, you know, who's going to be doing the construction work? You know, what do we know about it and how is it going to benefit our residents? Uh, when we had a similar pilot not too long ago uh, and we approved that, uh, it was very clear to see the the amount of jobs and the investment and, and what was going in. Uh, I'd just like to have a little bit more information given between first and second reading uh, and then also made public so that way our residents can uh, understand all of those same things as well before we vote. Okay, thank you. Is there any other? Discussion? Your Honor. I do have a, a question. I wonder if the folks from uh, National Church Residences would be able to answer, but um, I understand are this, these are um, apartments for low-income or fixed-income seniors. Is that correct? Can you come up here and answer? <laughs> um, sorry to put you on the spot, but um, no, okay. and uh, the low-income seniors who live there—is it a, like a scaled uh, rent? How they pay for their rent? How does correct. that work for you? Correct. Yeah. So there's uh, multiple income levels that are targeted. They're all considered low income. Mm -hmm. uh, the highest current income level is 60% of area median income, and then it goes down, staggered. All the way down to 30 percent of the area median, area median income. Okay. And just some context for the population that lives there: the average age is 73, and their average income is $14,000 a year. I appreciate that, and I just want to say that I know that um, so many. I'm new on City Council. I um, want to talk about a lot of the things. I talk about is one of the, I want this place to be a great place to raise a family. But I also know that only one in five. Um, people uh, in the homes are families, right? And we have so many more seniors and, and things like that. And I just appreciate the idea that you are doing um, improvements to this facility, to this apartment, to these homes for low-income seniors because my parents live in Madison Heights. They're in their 70s. And I want them to be able to age in place. And if they can't stay in their own home, I want them to be able to live in a place where they can afford that is also um, has dignity and it's beautiful to live in and is a great place. I've been to your facility before. I visited for various reasons and I appreciate what it is, but I appreciate that you're doing um, improvements that are going to improve the quality of life for those that people that live there. So that's, I just wanted to say thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I guess I'll just say while I'm up here, you know, National Church Residences, we purchased the property in 2015 and that was always with the intention of preserving the asset as affordable housing in perpetuity. So. Uh, we appreciate the council, you know, considering our request and with this request and with, you know, if this is approved, this will make our project much more competitive and will allow us to get the funds that we need in order to complete the renovation that uh, was, was ran through. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Your um, Honor. Did you have more questions while I was up there? Yeah. Yes. So you said you, you uh, purchased the property in 2015? Correct. And so um, are, I'm, I'm curious about the timing. Are, are you concerned about taking a hit from some of the... The new facility that's going up right next door? Uh, no, no. So we actually applied under, uh, to MISTA under the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, which is the program we would need to generate the, the, fine, the funds that we would need to do the project. And it was unsuccessful in April of 2019. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to resubmit this year, and this would make our application much stronger as having this ordinance mm -hmm. in effect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Are there any other questions for this gentleman before he sits down? Your Honor. <clears throat> Your Honor. Mr. Sherman. Excuse me. Uh, one point of information for council, and that is that staff has worked very hard on this proposal. We've actually been working with National Church Residences since 2016 to try to put this uh, together. And the point of information I wanted council to be aware of is in order for the pilot to go into effect, 50% of the units in Madison Manor would have to be occupied by low-income seniors who qualify 
With Cypress Partners, when we adopted the ordinance, that threshold was 42%. Because we have existing residents there, uh, Madison Manor agreed to bump up the minimum requirement in order for this to go into place to 50%. I just wanted council to be aware of that nuance. Great. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. All right. Any other questions for this gentleman? No. Okay. Thank you for, thank you. for speaking to us. Okay. Is there any other discussion? Just, I know that the developers came at one time, um, but it was before I was on city council, but they did a presentation about, about the property. I believe that was, that was actually the, the, the other property on DeQuinder, not this. Oh, this is the okay. first time National Church Residence has been in front of City okay. Council. Thank you for clarifying. Okay. Did you have any questions? No, Mr. That was, I was just going to cite that <clears throat> information. Oh, okay. Different property. <clears throat> All right. Different property. Anything else for discussion with this? No. All right. Then um, let's vote. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed, say no. All right, motion passes, thank you. Next up on the agenda, unfinished business, H1. We need to, uh, Mr. Sherman, does someone need to make a motion first to untable this then? Yes, to so, remove it from the table. Yeah, in order for city council, a motion needs to be made to remove ordinance 2148 medical marijuana facilities amendment for the second reading and it has to be approved by the simple majority. Okay, can, would someone like to make a motion to untable ordinance? Your Honor. Mr. Bliss? Uh, I move that we will uh, we remove uh, Ordinance 2148 uh, from the table uh, for consideration tonight. Thank you. Is there a second? Your Honor. I'll support. Thank you. All right. A motion has been made and seconded to mm. remove Ordinance 2148 from the table. Uh, Ma'am, uh, could we have a roll call on it, please? And uh, I was going to ask if there is discussion. I'm sorry. That's okay. If there is no discussion, then can we do a roll call vote, please? Yes. Councilman Bliss. Yes. Councilman Clark. Yes. Councilman Corbett. No. Mayor Pro Tem, Mayor Pro Tem Grafstein. Yes. Councilman Roback. Yes. Councilman Soltis. No. All right, thank you. Uh, the motion passes for two. It has been back on the, it is put back on the agenda. Not sure the terminology here. All right, so uh, next up then would be a second reading of Ordinance 2148. What is the wish of council? Your Honor. Mr. Bliss. I move that we adopt Ordinance 2148 on second reading. Thank you, is there support? Your Honor. Mrs. Clark. I support. Thank you, a motion has been made and seconded to adopt Ordinance to adopt Ordinance 2148, Medical mm -hmm. Marijuana Facilities on second reading. Mrs. Marsh, before we have discussion, is there anything you would like to add to all this? I mean, typically I would um, read my comments at this time, but they're the same comments that I've read the past two meetings. So I'm actually gonna to defer to our assistant city attorney, Nick, to address some of the concerns, not only that we've heard here tonight, but that were also published in the newspaper. Um, so. Mayor, pro tem, council, good evening. Um, on the agenda for this evening is uh, ordinance, second reading. Uh, for your consideration that basically uh, goes back and looks at the original intent to make the map uh, all controlling with regard to the separation of medical marijuana facilities from certain uh, other parcels within the city zones, residential zones, uh, daycares, churches, etc. cetera. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Berher kind of hit the nail on the head when he d uh, discussed that the fact that the, even though the ordinance does remove the 500 foot language from the proposed ordinance, uh, the map, uh, again, it refers to the map as the controlling document and the map preserves and continues the original directive of council to maintain a 500 foot separation distance, except for the one limited uh, error that was discovered after the licenses were awarded and uh, for the exceptions listed in the ordinance, it for all intensive purposes, absolutely 100% maintains the <coughs> 500 foot separation distances that council originally established. So the map by uh, publishing and approving, being asked to approve the official map this evening, council is approving 
uh, an official document that establishes those uh, required setbacks to maintain certain distances, albeit except for the one error, um, from, from those uh, places. With regard to the number of maps, there was one, only one official map that was published originally. There was only one official map that was published. This map uh, is substantially similar to that original map, which was based on the 500 foot separation distances. Uh, this map is actually a little more restrictive because it removes a few uh, parcels from that map. So in actuality, this approved map, if council approves this map together with the ordinance, uh, would be further restricting the number of parcels allowed to be located uh, for medical marijuana facilities within the city. Um, again, that preserves, by referring to that map as an official document, preserves the restriction to protect the public in uh, residential zones and other zones that council directed staff to do with regard to the original enactment of this ordinance. Um, I would also like to state that there was something mentioned in the paper about a thousand foot separation distance from, uh, I believe it was schools and marijuana facilities. That has nothing to do with medical marijuana facilities. That has everything to do with uh, adult use or recreational facilities. The only separation distance or, or location requirements for medical marijuana facilities is that they be located in an industrial district, which this ordinance does, or an agricultural district, which the city has none. Uh, so this ordinance does comply with state law. The comment in the paper about a thousand square feet, I think mischaracterizes what this council is considering tonight for medical facilities only. This council has not directed any action be taken with regard to adult use facilities and that thousand foot uh, requirement under state law, which can be waived by this council if and when you take that subject up, uh, only applies to adult use and recreational. But um, by publishing that map, you are indeed solidifying a very precise document that establishes parcel by parcel as opposed to arguments which could be made from measuring from certain parts. Do you measure from over here of this side of the podium or this side of the podium to allow certain parcels in? And the original intent was to give everybody a clear picture and understanding via the map of what parcels would be allowed and what wouldn't be allowed. But by all means, it does maintain the separation distances, except for those limited number of circumstances or exceptions that are contained in the ordinance. And we believe the map adequately took into account and takes into account council's desire to keep these facilities at a certain distance from, from those, uh, those locations. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Uh, I, ha I actually have a question, um, just sorry, I, I appreciate you clarifying this. Um, there's a lot of different laws within the state and it gets very confusing. Um, but a few people, I think one person mentioned it tonight and I've had a few people contact me regarding what are being called grow houses. And I don't believe that is the correct legal term. I believe they are referring to caregivers. And it's my understanding that those are not regulated by the city and that there is nothing we can do. Can you just maybe educate um, members of council yeah. and the public, please? Thank, Thank you. you. Um, in 2008, Michigan passed the initial uh, marijuana laws that allowed the caregiver patient model where uh, caregivers could uh, register themselves in up to five patients and technically grow up to 72 plants. That is the caregiver patient model uh, that's been a, in effect for almost or over 12 years now. Uh, then in 2016, we had the Medical Marijuana Facilities Licensing Act, which then transformed into the, this council 
approving an ordinance that we're talking about this evening for allowing a very limited number of medical marijuana facilities. And now just recently was passed in 2018, the adult use or recreational, as I like to call it, uh, uh, as marijuana establishments. Um, and again, that's not what we're discussing tonight. With regard to caregiver patient grows, caregiver is lawfully allowed to grow up to 72 plants as long as it complies with state law, which is pretty much in a locked secured facility. There was a recent Michigan Court of Appeals case. The Supreme Court is currently reviewing what they're going to do. They had oral arguments back in October. They have not decided the case or, or what they're gonna do with the case yet, but the present state of the law per the Michigan Court of Appeals is that if there's a caregiver exercising their lawful ability or right to grow their allowed plants in a secured facility, municipalities in Michigan are not allowed to dictate where they can go within the municipality. Um, that, that's a very clear mandate. Council was provided a, a legal opinion or a legal update with regard to that. So unfortunately with regard to caregiver grows, as long as they're complying with all other city codes, such as building codes, electrical, plumbing, um, and obtain a proper certificate of occupancy to occupy that building for the proposed use, unfortunately the city is without any legal authority to dictate where those caregiver grows can be located. As a matter of fact, they can be located in somebody's garage, a caregiver's garage. Some caregivers have opted to uh, <coughs> either purchase or rent uh, either industrial or commercial or other buildings. Um, and unfortunately, the city is not in a position as of yet, because the Supreme Court has not said otherwise to this date, that uh, municipalities can legally uh, dictate where they can be located within the city. So you're correct, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, that the city's hamstrung with regard to where they can be lawfully located. Okay, thank you. And just um, along those lines, the Van Fleets have talked about something that is near them. If this is a caregiver, and I'm going to guess that it is because right now the city has only licensed two facilities, neither of which are doing anything, I'm going to assume that this is a caregiver um, and there's nothing that they can, there's nothing the city can do in this situation because it is a state regulated. That's correct. That's correct, okay, and these four uh, locations that Mrs. Holder was referring to, these are also state regulated and there's nothing the city can do at this time. At this time, presently, I checked the Supreme Court website this morning and as of this morning, they have not ruled one way or the other, so we have to follow a law that's been put in place by the Court of Appeals, which clearly states that cities, as long as they're complying with the medical or the caregiver patient, uh, laws enacted in 2008 that they can grow uh, as long as it's in a secure facility. Okay, thank you. And then with respect to this specific ordinance, um, there seems to be a lot of confusion. Uh, it sounds to some people as though we're saying initially it has to be 500 feet from here and now we're saying you can be next door. And um, what you have said, if I've understood correctly, is actually that that is not true, that this is a map. The map that has been updated is the governing map and we've removed parcels. And if it's, would it be true then if we were to adopt this 498 or a 300 foot, that it would actually be allowing more parcels than we're allowing now? And that by keeping it this way with this map, we're, we're keeping it as is and we're not allowing more? If council were to consider some ordinance language that would change the 500 foot to 350, 400, whatever it may be, then, then staff would have to go back, take a look at the map. It would certainly uh, allow many more parcels to be located within the city. So it would open up uh, more and, and, allow par and allow these locations to be closer to those uh, locations that council was interested in keeping certain distances from. So yes, it would, would create a map that would create more allowable parcels, whereas this map creates less than the present map. I believe you said there were four that were removed. 
I, I wasn't involved in the mapping okay. process. I believe there were several public parcels okay. removed, and then there were several uh, industrial parcels removed. Ms. Marsh might be able to expand on that. It wasn't a lot, it was a handful. Okay. But again, it's, it's in, in doing so, it's actually more restrictive than before. Than it was before. Okay, thank you. I appreciate thank your you. clarification on that. Is there any more discussion from other members of council? Your Honor. Yeah, I have, um, Robert's rule of order uh, question there for the council um, uh, lawyer. So if, um, you know, if I want to do a substitute motion, I'd have to wait until this was voted on, correct? Or it would become no. useless at that point. Yeah. Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor. Yes, Mr. Chairman. You don't have to wait. You can make a substitute motion. If you have, uh, if you have support for the substitute motion, a vote would be on the substitute motion before the main motion. Then I'd like to make a substitute motion. I want to add, I think we came up with 320 feet, add it to the ordinance, uh, excluding the playground, soccer field, and schools, preschools. Okay, thank you, Mr. Soltis. Is there support for this uh, alternate motion? Yeah, there's so support, uh, Madam Mayor. Okay. Uh, is that the only thing, though, that would need to be changed? Is this a 320 feet? I, I guess I'm asking the attorney, what's your view of the uh, amendment? I, I, I'm, sorry. Sorry. I'm not hearing the question. I, I guess I'm at, he, you just said I, 320 feet. 320 feet. I think uh, city manager, isn't it the, the number? Yeah, you would be replacing the 500 feet with 320 feet, but also you said we, you would be That's adding other language to make it also a distance from the park, so it's a cord, current ordinance does not include. And what else did you say? How would that affect um, the Mac, the former Mac building? Um. Is the soccer field less than 300? I imagine it's more than 320 feet from It there. is. This, yes, the soccer field is more than 300 feet from 2HX. I don't know what other parcels adding the parks will take into account. Um, there are other parcels that will come off the map. Yeah, I, uh, I think. That's what I want. Yeah. Point of clarification, please. You said excluding parks and what else? Uh, playgrounds, uh, soccer fields, schools, preschools. Madam Chair. And I believe, um, except with regard to parks, when we exclude schools, that includes all school property being any playgrounds located in the school. It wouldn't include the soccer fields if, if this motion were to pass. We could include parks and the soccer fields, which would be, or all park property, which would encompass, sorry, which would encompass soccer fields, uh, playgrounds, and uh, school premises. Okay, so, we have, okay, so just Robert's rules. Um, we have a substitute motion on the table, uh, motion made by Councilman Soltis, supported by Councilman Corbett, to change the language to be 320 feet from parks, schools, preschools. I'm not sure what else. I think you just need to add all parks property to what you currently have. All parks property should take into consideration the soccer field, the water park, any city owned park, rather than spell those out. But let me see what the actual. Madam Chair, I would agree or concur with Ms. Mars that by adding parks, that I think that would cover the maker of the motion's desires with regard to playgrounds and, and uh, the uh, soccer fields. Those are designated as part of property. So to clarify, it would say, my understanding with what you're asking, it would say no medical marijuana facility shall be located within 320 feet or be adjacent to or abut a school building, church, family, child care home, group child care home, all parks property or a residential district where residential units are located. That's correct. Madam Mayor. Mr. Sherman. Does support agree with the amendment yes. to the motion? Yes, yep. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. So um, we have the substitute motion. So we need to vote on that one there discuss yes. discussion. Discussion. first. Okay. So before we do, we do that, let's have a discussion. Mrs. Your, Your Honor, Mr. Corbett. Uh, just a few things. Let me uh, let me agree with something that the uh, city attorney said before I disagree with you on a couple of things. Um, I would remind the council that well over a year ago, when we first began the discussion of this ordinance, predates I realize a couple of folks here. The attorney's office did clearly warn the council that this whole issue of distance uh, was tricky. Uh, that that it, it depended who measured it, where you measured from. You know, what was your methodology, what was your protocol, et cetera. Uh, so I, I appreciate that. Num but somewhere late la at the time the ordinance was constructed, I didn't get the memo that said the map was ever supposed to be controlling. Uh, it was clearly the intent that the map would be correct because it would be in agreement with the plain text of the ordinance. But the, but to set up this dichotomy that you had this map and then the wording and this would control, that's not, that's not accurate in my view. I think that got into the conversation about six, eight months ago as an attempt to try and lead the council out of this problem. Uh, but but I, I didn't get that memo. And as far as, uh, as, far as the, the map having a limited property, I strongly suspect that the three or four properties that were eliminated that were taken off the map recently I'm gonna guess they never should have been on the map in the first place. Uh, because uh, going from 500 to zero feet isn't gonna add property, uh, pardon me, isn't gonna eliminate properties. Uh, so it was probably a reinterpretation, which leads me back to a point that Mr. Bliss made about a month ago, which was, are we sure we got the damn map right yet? There's nothing should have come off of there if, if it was correct. So while I appreciate the, I think Consul did botch this, and I will I will take my one seventh blame on that. But but to go forward with this um, is not reasonable. It, and, and, but what I think is reasonable is establishing some sort of a buffer, because as a matter of fact, it will in the future come into play at such time as we redefine properties. Now. It's fair to say how often do we go from business to manufacturing. We don't do that. We don't rezone very often. Although I would remind the council that we are in the middle of a redraft of the master proposal. And both the mayor and uh, Mr. Bliss have clearly indicated that redefining properties is a reasonable option depending on, on what's found as we examine our developmental issues. Um, so no, this, uh, like I said, we've got an immediate problem. I think we do have to, I think we can all agree we got to do something on that. Um, but I mean, let's not, let's not clutter this up with more nonsense. Let's deal with the problem, get this behind us. We've got a couple of strong, uh, in, in my opinion, remember at, at this council table, I probably have my foot on both sides of this, this argument. On the one hand, I did favor bringing the medical marijuana in and I did vote for the two licenses. I am concerned about the growth and keeping it within the zones. Originally, we talked about industrial. I don't, you know, manufacturing was a compromise because there wasn't enough industrial space, purely industrial space available. So um, I, I, I've got, you know, like I said, there's plenty of blame. And, and I think too, we're, we're plowing some new ground. This isn't the sort of thing we do every year, bring in new industry. Uh, new risk, new opportunities, and money, as somebody said there. But uh, but I, I would recommend adopting the proposal. It's sensible. It's it's reasonable. It strikes a balance. It gets and it gets it gets this behind us, which is not a, a bad idea, ladies and gentlemen. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor, Mrs. Robach. Um, is. I want a clarification because I think that we were hearing that a 300 foot, 320 foot, whatever it was that you just uh, suggested, is going to expand the number of parcels and properties that are available for this type of business. So it's going to expand it. So if we're talking, if, if, the, if the question is, we don't want it to go any farther than this, but you're put, just put on the table for us to expand it. That does not make any sense to me. 
with this arbitrary, like, what is the throw? It, the number is like somehow a pet that you're gonna, it's gonna make you feel better that it's there, but the, the fact is that the map has a more restrictive, it has more restrictive parameters that are gonna keep these kinds of businesses in a, a smaller area than what it has been allowed until now. So I don't see why we would want to expand it. If you're not in favor of, of having these businesses in, in more places, why are we expanding the map? Your Honor? Yeah. Actually, I, I actually would like to say something. Okay. Um, so a really good point was made, and it was regarding measurement. And I don't know exactly when we found out that this property was not within, or was within the 500. But I do know that at some point during the course of this last year, year and a half that we've been working on this, there was a conversation about how do we measure. I'm sitting here, so do we measure from here? Do we measure from here? Do we measure from in the middle? There are some measurements that are taken from the middle of the property, some that are taken from the middle of the road. How do we measure? And for that reason alone, I am very leery about having a specific number being attached to this. So um, I am inclined to vote against the substitute motion, but in favor of the original motion, just keeping in mind we will be voting first on the substitute motion, because I would like to have this cleaned up. I would like people to go online once we publish this, look at the map and say, oh, 123 Elm Street, whatever, it's in the map, it's not in the map, it's in the green zone, which it sounds, that's what Mr. Pahora did. He looked at our original map. And he's like, oh look, there's a property that's in the zone. He didn't go out and measure it. That wasn't his responsibility. That was the responsibility of us. That was the responsibility of, of staff and of council to approve that. And somewhere along the lines, this was incorrectly measured. And I'm going to guess that it was because how it was measured, but GIS is not my thing, so I don't know. But I do think we need to take out this number and keep it the way it is. My, I, I have a big fear of adding in a number and then finding out that we've just added more properties when it sounds like everyone wants to keep the properties limited. Mr. Solter. All right, Your Honor. So it may, listen, I wanted 1,000 feet from the get-go, and I wanted 500 feet. Uh, the only reason we changed it is because we made a mistake. That's the only reason we're voting on this again. Otherwise, it would be 500. So since we can't have 500 because of that, then I'm on, I might as well take the 320. And it doesn't mean there's so many licenses that we're going to give out. So don't, please don't say that there's more property now and more licenses are going to go out. That's not, that's not true. That's, that's, um, that's like a half-truth. Uh, so I'd rather have 320 feet that makes these regulations. Um, you know, I, I, um, I'll bring up a side point, is that um, we created that soccer building, right? And so um, I coach over at the, the middle school when we have our games, and I swear to God, the, it, it, you could throw a rock at those big, giant uh, incinerators. And to me, that was why in the world did that thing go up, and why did they put a school right next to it? And, and that's exactly what I'm talking about with this stuff. And that's why if I can't have 500, then I at least get 320. And the map can always be changed. The, the resident, Mr. Bahuri said that, yeah, it's gonna go through that process, and yes, it does. But the fact is, is that it still can happen. And I want something on the books, at least when I'm on council, that I can say, you know, we did this, and I'm not responsible what happens in the future. I can only do what I can do right now. Okay, thank you. Is there yeah. any more discussion? Your Honor, if we were to adopt uh, the ordinance with Mr. Soltis's changes, um, would City Council be able to go back and change that, that number or the map in any other way? Madam Chair. Yes. As this council is aware, we update our ordinances all the time. Mm -hmm. Any ordinance can be changed on majority of this council's vote at any point in time. So the map could be changed at any point in time by this council by a majority vote. The ordinance can be changed at any time by a majority vote of this council. So either or could be changed, the map or the feet. 
Uh, and it would go through the same processes, it, right? We would regardless. have to go to a first, a second reading. You would, you council would dictate to staff what you would like to see, either in a map or an ordinance, um, with regard to any changes that would have to be made, and they'd have to be made at a public meeting like tonight. Do we have any idea of what the cost of changing this ordinance with Mr. Soltis's proposal would be uh, leaving tonight's meeting and all the staff that would be involved in rewriting that language and bringing it back to the table, only for us to eventually one day maybe go back in and change that again? Uh, <laughs> one more thing, or um, would it be more cost effective to pass the ordinance as written on second reading this evening and not waste any more tax dollars, and when we reach the potential of ever changing this again, we would be going through the same process and in turn saving money? Certainly there's gonna be a cost anytime you ask the legal department to draft anything on behalf of council. Given the proposed change, I wouldn't suspect it be a tremendous cost uh, to the city because it's what's proposed in the substitute motion is a very simple change and could be effectuated rather quickly by our office. I couldn't give you a solid number. As far as staff time is concerned, they're paid a, a salary <laughs> uh, for their time anyway, so they would just be devoting time to that. Uh, so I don't know if that would incur any extra costs outside of their normal salaries. Um, and I would point out one thing uh, to council, maybe a little bit response to Mr. Corbett's comments, that um, the, the language all along in the ordinance uh, that I think we keep missing a little bit too is the following, that the city shall publish and make available an official map depicting all individual parcels that are located in the M1, M2 district that are eligible for locating an approved medical marijuana facility. Any application that proposes a location other than a parcel approved on the official map shall be immediate cause for rejection and denial of the application. Now I know, speaking of the dichotomy that Mr. Corbett was speaking of, the 500 feet didn't meet the map, and that's where the disconnect came because of the measurement error, but I think that references the initial intent at least to have the map controlling uh, because it was, it was presented that way to the public. If you're on the map, you're allowed. If you're not on the map, you're not allowed. And I'm not taking a position one way or the other, uh, but to answer your question, uh, the cost would be relatively low, at least from my perspective. Maybe Ms. Marsh thinks otherwise, but I, I 500 to $1,000 at the most for our time, and that wouldn't be That's that. That's a lot much. of money for me. <laughs> That's nothing to shake a stick at. Mr. Sherman, is there? Yeah. Um, for the benefit of council, I just want council to be aware that if the substitute motion were to pass, relating to a 320 foot setback, that would also bring back into play the exception relating to a 250 foot setback mm -hmm. if two properties are separated by an interstate highway. Mm -hmm. So that would, I want council to be aware of that if the substitute motion were to pass by reinserting uh, 320 in place of the previous draft 500 foot separation. Maker of the motion? Yes. Yeah. Support. Okay. okay. Mr. Belus, you had something. Yes, Your Honor. Um, <clears throat> so as was noted, uh, actually it's interesting, hearing my name mentioned several times, I felt like I was in one of those uh, democratic debates and I needed to raise my hand. Uh, <laughs> I, <clears throat> all along I've been simply saying we need to make the best of the situation that we're in. Uh, we, we've opened ourselves up as a city to potential litigation uh, it's, it's a pure fact, uh, and we need to make this right. Uh, now, what I'm not seeing here tonight, and I'm hoping that will be published by staff and posted on social media, uh, I asked at first reading for the appropriate policy and or staffing changes that will ensure that we don't find ourselves in this situation again. Uh, I'd like that to be published for our residents. Um, but. It's interesting, so I mean, we're a few days away from uh, uh, Friday the 13th, and I, I just saw Councilman Soltis uh, vote to approve a medical marijuana ordinance. <laughs> so <clears throat> I, 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 think, I think it's, it, both are reasonable, right? Uh, there are a few facts, though. So either way that we take this, there are a few facts. Ordinances can be changed, the map can be changed. Any future council can 
make a determination to expand a map. They can make a determination to uh, change the ordinance. As Councilman Soltis did note, though, we need to do the best that we can do today in our votes. Uh, second, there's no new properties on this map. So when I voted for the map originally with uh, Councilman Corbett, uh, with Mayor Hartwell, and with uh, then Councilor Grafstein, now Mayor Pro Tem Grafstein, the map didn't add any new properties from then to now. Same map we voted on then to now. Uh, and if we do cut to 350 or 320, I think it's the 320 feet, there will be new properties added. So I, I, I support both. I think that there are the same benefits to this industry as had been noted before. And one of the benefits is that hopefully with approved professional operating facilities, some of these caregivers in these neighborhoods that we keep talking about, maybe they'll get out of here. Maybe they'll close down because of supply and demand. If there are professional operations in our city that are accessible to the people who need them, maybe the caregivers can get out. And so I, I think both are, are, are reasonable. I would support either uh, variation that has been. I, I will vote yes on the substitute, and if that fails, I will vote yes on the map. They are both reasonable ways for us to be able to move forward and get past this. And I would also say, too, to everybody that came and spoke, I appreciate all of you coming and investing your time. This was not a short meeting. It's already after 9 o'clock. Uh, I appreciate you all coming out, sharing, uh, your thoughts on this issue and learning about uh, what it is. Sometimes when you see a, a news article that's potentially a little bit sensationalized, uh, it's easy to get kind of swept up in the news article and the social media buzz, and all of you took it upon yourselves to come here to be heard and to listen uh, to what the ordinance was, and I, I appreciate that. I and the third generation of my family in the city, my kids are the fourth, they're all school-age children, so I appreciate what everybody's saying about wanting to protect the neighborhoods, our schools, and our parks. Both ways, whichever we adopt, we'll do that tonight. And I'm, I'm proud of that, and I'm thankful for this council for brainstorming creative solutions to get us out of this mess. And I would hope that I can see something on social media posted uh, by the city later this week that goes over the policy changes that we are making on a staff level to make sure that this doesn't happen again. That's it, Ron. Madam Mayor. Yes. Just, just one, I was going to shut up, but I never learned. Uh, <laughs> just, just one comment on this idea that uh, putting in the 320 feet is going to add properties to the uh, available properties. One of two things, if that's correct, then one of two things is true. Either my math is a lot worse than it used to be, because that should eliminate increasing the size of a buffer. But if that's not true, then you all should start to continue to worry about how this map is being calculated. If you increase a, a setback by 320 feet and somehow you manage to add properties, something's wrong. That's either, I mean, I, I understand. I saw the it's, same notes you did. But, but, but then we need, to, we need to concern ourselves with how this, this map is being constructed. Your Honor, can yeah. we clarify that he's not suggesting that we add an additional 320 feet no, to no. 500, no. that he's taking it down from 500 to 320, correct. which would but decrease the amount of space between these properties I, and what they're not supposed to be near. Okay, Mr. Soltis, and then I think we need some clarification from our legal staff again. Uh, I'm sorry, Councilwoman, you're, you're talking about what, the motion that I made? I'm just asking yeah. for clarification because... Well, well I'm, go going from zero from zero three, I'm going from zero to 320. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. How do you add properties that way? Although the ordinance does eliminate the language of 500 feet, mm -hmm. the map is still based off a 500-foot separation okay. distance, give or take, but depending on the... I guess there's a standard deviation in the GIS process. I, it's a small standard deviation, and then the limited exceptions in the ordinance. Okay, but it's going. So, so the map, as we look at it today, to be approved by council, is based off, for all intents and purposes, 500 feet. If you approve an ordinance saying, well, we only want a separation distance of 300 feet, as opposed to what the map currently proposes, 500 feet, you're taking away 180 feet, thus 
lessening okay. the distance from which these parcels have to be located from residential and zones. Going from 500 to, if I may, if we're going going from 500 to 320, not from zero to 320. Correct. We never went to zero. To I, I think that was misportrayed in the paper. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because. Uh, that was never the intent. That's why council's asked to approve this map. That was always based off council's original directive of 500 feet. Sure. The only reason we're here tonight is because one error was made with regard to that one property that happened to be awarded a license. Yeah, I kept getting told that and I kept going, that can't be right. Something's that's wrong with that. But let's be clear, we know we're adding at least one property and that's the whole reason we're making the modification. We're adding the Well, and that property it. was mistakenly on the original map, Got albeit it. not. 500 feet. Got it, and it will still be under the new map if the 320 Correct. feet is okay. It'll be that, under the new map no matter what. All set. All right, is everybody clear on this? Okay, I'm sorry, we've closed public comment. Um, I do have one last, hopefully, question for legal. We've awarded two licenses. We only have two licenses available. Yes? If I may. Yes. Um, actually, it's two locations with three two licenses locations. at each yes. location. So yes. council uh, in the ordinance allowed two grow, two processor, two provisioning centers, four labs and four uh, secure transporters, which to date we've received no applications okay. and no locations for labs or secure transporters. The interest was solely in grow processor and provisioning. Cool. But because this council enacted an ordinance that favored co-locating those three location, those three licenses, a grow processor and provisioning center, uh, in actuality, even though there's six licenses, two grow, two process, two provisioning, it's only been awarded to two locations, the Ajax location and the Stevenson address, well, the old bowling alley on Stevenson. So three licenses at each location, which each will have to pay a licensing fee for each three, right. each license to the state, to the city, uh, and so forth. Okay, thank you. So this. This is really only if someone were to apply for a third license, which at this point, or a third location, which at this point in time, council has not approved a third location. Under the current license. ordinance, mm -hmm. both yes. past and the one presented for night, tonight, there are no new licenses okay. to be awarded. Again, as discussed by council, those ordinance, the map, can be changed by a majority vote if council moves forward on any issues. So they could potentially vote at some point in the future to add additional medical marijuana facilities if you so choose. If you don't choose, that's okay. your prerogative. But at tonight's meeting, there are no new licenses as part of this proposed amendment. It was a small, small amendment to correct the issue at hand. Thank you. All right. Your Honor. Just as a clarification, <clears throat> there is still the potential of those four transport facility licenses and the four labs <laughs> that could locate, just to be clear, there is no new licenses is not necessarily correct. I, and I'm sorry, I, miss, I misspoke, you're correct. Even though we, council approved four labs and four trans, transporters and we didn't receive any applications for those types of facilities, at, at present, based on the ordinance, it's a rolling application process. So if somebody desires to come in and present the proper application materials to the city, they could be issued a license for a secure transporter or a lab, yes. Thank you for that clarification. Is there any, Sorry. Is there any more discussion on the substitute motion? All right. Uh, Mr. Sherman, can you, because it was a bit technical, could you please restate the substitute motion so that we can give me a roll call to vote and yeah. do a roll okay. call vote? I, I think, I think either the Madam Chair, I think either the city manager or the city clerk should restate okay. the motion. Okay. I don't have the ordinance in front of me, but I do know that the uh, 
the substitute motion was to change the um, <coughs> distance to 320 feet um, I can and read. then to add the word, the verbiage, all park property. I'll just read what it is because there was Thank more you. to it than Thank that. You. That no ma the motion to make no medical marijuana facilities shall be located within 320 feet of or be adjacent to or abut a school building, church, family child care home, group child care home, all park property, or a residential district where residential units are located, and also that the separation location distance of 320 feet may be reduced to 250 feet if two locations are separated by an interstate highway. Okay, thank you for restating. We're going to do a roll call vote. Just to clarify, a yes is to approve the substitution vote with the 320 feet. Clerk, can you please do a roll call vote? Yes, mm -hmm. I sure can. Um, Councilman Clark. No. Councilman Corbett. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grafstein. No. Councilor Rohrbeck. No. Councilman Soltis. Yes. Councilman Bliss. Yes. Motion fails. Now there needs to be a vote on the main motion. Okay. Um, which I think we've already had, a, have we had a motion made for that? Yes. I can't yes. remember. Okay, so now <laughs> we're going to do a roll call vote, please, mm -hmm. for- um, Your Honor, is there a discussion about the original motion at this point? Mm -hmm. Did we have one? I mean, <laughs> I know we no, have no. I have not had one then, yes. yes. Discussion about okay, that. we have not yes. had a discussion, sorry, it's been a long night. We have not had sorry. a discussion. Mrs. Warbeck, if you would like to make some comments for this I discussion. Would. I would like to make some comments. So I, I am in support of this, um, this amendment right now because number one, it does not make it so that there's no separation between, it doesn't take us down to zero. It does not take us down to zero at all. Instead it does two things. It goes lot by lot, parcel by parcel to indicate where these types of businesses are going to be allowed. The map includes parameters. It's not just like, like somebody started poking the map and deciding, it, it includes parameters that include that 500 feet that, that we're all talking about. It doesn't go away, right? Besides the exception of the Ajax Drive site, the new map is even more restrictive than the original ordinance on the map. And number two, the controlling green zone map removes any ambiguity about where we measure from and like, is it in the middle of the parking lot, in the middle of the building or to somebody else's driveway, where is that? Those numbers get super ambiguous and so this takes that away. If their parcel that is part of their property, if this property, that whole property, if it's on the map, it's allowed. If it's not on the map, it's not allowed. And the idea that we can change things, oh no, it could be changed. It can be changed because everything could be changed. There are, we live in a democracy where we have legislative rules and people, you can always amend and change laws and that is the point here, right? So if we are looking at a, a place that is, a map that is taking away all our ambiguity about where these properties are allowed, that to me, is the best way, the, most, the simplest and most effective way that we can go forward with this. I am a mother of three young children that are growing up in this city. They go to the parks, they play at the soccer field, they do all those things. I lived in a house that had a wall to a, to a, um, a shopping center for 12 years. I know what is, I live here, this is my home. I'm not making this decision lightly. I'm doing it because I think this is the best, simplest, most effective way that we can protect our families, our children, our seniors, and allow these types of businesses to operate safely in our city and give access to, these are medical marijuana facilities right now, right? We're giving access to folks like Vita. She may not ever partake of it, but anybody who has MS, anybody who has these medical conditions that, that desire to use um, marijuana and cannabis as a, uh, a healing property, this is part of why this was approved in the first place. I do not believe the madness that, that in the, the 
that it is going to be somehow corrupting all of our families and children because it is nearby. It is not. And these are going to be beautiful sites that are going to improve our quality of life for our residents. It's going to improve the, the, this, how our city presents itself. And it is going to be something that is, is going to be for everyone. For that reason and those reasons, I am going to be supporting this, this amendment, this amendment to the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to make a comments and discussion? Your Honor? J yes. just, just a couple sure. uh, points to, to summarize my, uh, why I'm voting against this. But let's, let's be clear, and it popped up here recently, there's been an attempt to kind of turn this into a discussion about whether mar medical marijuana is good or bad. That decision was made months ago. If this, if this proposal is turned down tonight, if the council were to, uh, to vote this down, there still would be two facilities within the city of Madison Heights. So the attempts to try and turn this into something else are, are not legitimate. Um, that was never about that. If this site ended up not going forward, and there are a number of reasons, by the way, it might not. I mean, the, these are great businessmen who I, all, who I really do respect. I've, I've dealt with them in the past on different issues. Uh, but the fact of the matter remains, it's a long way from concept to, uh, to opening, uh, to the grand opening. And if that location didn't end up being used, I 100% guarantee you another one will be. We've got 17 people waiting in line, or whatever it is, to, uh, to go in there. But at the moment, the, the law calls for any particular lot has to meet three standards. It has to be an M1 or M2. It has to be 500 feet from residential, and there's some definition of residential. And it may not abut uh, schools, parks. There was a number of things it cannot do. Three criteria. So I, I don't know how we can say the safety of the community if we believed in that ordinance when we voted on it in the first place. Reducing one of those, the 500 foot, somehow makes us better off, somehow makes us safer. It certainly makes our life a lot easier. But, but we, can't, we can't stop trying to change this into something it isn't. So that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Bliss, anything? Yes, Your Honor. Um, I, 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 I agree with uh, most of what Councilman Corbett said. I, I appreciate the, the passion. And like I said, with the last substitute motion, you know, they're both logical ways of cleaning this up. Um, I think what we have to keep track of is this is actually less property is on this map that we're adopting now than the map that we already adopted. And so for me, this is a continuation of that vote that you were just talking about of why we did what we did for medical marijuana. You know, we're taking this exception for one building, but it's actually lessening the map all across the board. And so I'm supportive of this, both because we have to clean it up because we're really exposed, the city is exposed right now to potential litigation and we have to clean it up. But two, this actually reduces the footprint of available medical marijuana in the city, uh, which is, I, I also think, a benefit for those who spoke out tonight in opposition to having marijuana in the neighborhoods. This is a smaller footprint than it was before. So it does achieve both of those things, cleaning it up, protecting the city from litigation, and reducing the footprint of available uh, marijuana facilities. Because as was noted, while the two stacked license sites have been awarded, there are still the potential for transport facilities and labs uh, that could come in at any point in time. And so this reduces it and it cleans it up and, and I am very much supportive of it. Thank you. Mrs. Clark, anything? Nope, no. Mr. Soltis. All right, um, I, I have nothing to add to this. This has been a long conversation and I think it's time we do a vote. I'm going to restate the original motion and then ask for a roll call vote. Um, this is a motion to approve ordinance 2148 to amend section 3-310 of article 16 of chapter seven regarding location, location requirements for medical marijuana on second reading. If you are in favor, please signify by saying aye. Opposed, say no. Madam Chair. Sherman. Um, 
two misstatements in the motion. It's to amend section 7-310 of article 16 of chapter seven regarding location requirements for medical marijuana on second reading. Thank you for that clarification, I misspoke. Councilman Corbett. No. Mayor Pertum Grafstein. Yes. Councilor Roback. Yes. Councilman Soltis. No. Councilman Bliss. Yes. Council Councilwoman Clark. Yes. Thank you. The motion passes four two. All right. And uh, next up is the minutes. Um, so what is the wish of council regarding the minutes of the regular city council meeting of February 24th? Uh, Madam Mayor. Mr. Corbett. Uh, I move that the uh, council approve the minutes of February 24th. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Mr. Corbett, for making that motion as we continue on with our council meeting. Do I have a second for the <laughs> minutes? Your Honor, I'll second. Thank you, Mrs. Clark, and thank you everyone for leaving quietly this evening. <laughs> motion has been made and seconded to approve the council meetings, the council minutes of the, the <laughs> council minutes of the meeting from February 24th. Is there any discussion? All right, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion passes. All right. Um, I think that is it for the evening. Uh, before we close this session, I'm going to ask for any closing comments from <coughs> council and staff. Mr. Corbett? Uh, just a couple of, e couple of uh, matters. And on, on the subject of something much less controversial, <laughs> let, let's talk about viruses and... and uh, <laughs> And number 19, um, I, I want to I, I want to single out uh, uh, the manager, uh, Ms. Marsh, her work over the past couple of uh, weeks, the last week in particular, along with staff, fire and police department, have generated have generated uh, a great protocol and plan. She made reference to it earlier when we were talking about the uh, the acquisition of that decontamination uh, equipment, but. Um, Cindy, would you do me a favor and thank you. Uh, I, I also wanted to, uh, to, to, to make an observation that uh, really what's needed is uh, some calm heads and maybe a little less uh, bright red lettering on TV that says, you know, update in crisis and <laughs> pandemic and everything. Uh, the fact of the matter is that we're going to have a couple of tough weeks here, both locally and nationally. Uh, the testing results will become uh, become more widespread over the next two weeks, and we're going to wake up some morning and think that the whole country has just been swallowed up by some uh, virus. And in fact, that's not true. It's just we've been living with it for a little while now. We just didn't know it. Um, I take one. I take confidence in in one thing. Everybody talks about the statistics coming out of China: roughly 90,000 cases, about 3,000 deaths. That's not the, uh, what's the old line about if, uh, statistics? If you uh, torture them enough, they'll say whatever you want them to say. They leave out the other part of it. There are 90,000 cases in a country of 1.8 billion people. Uh, if those numbers are relevant at all to us here in this country and this state, the fact of the matter is you're much more likely to, to get hit by a bus tomorrow than, than contracting the disease and let alone anything else. So. Um, I would just, in my little uh, corner of the world here with you guys, uh, just urge restraint and, uh, and uh, calm and respect for our, our neighbors. We'll get through this. It's not going to be easy couple of months, but uh, we'll get there. We always do, and we always will. Uh, I will be back again on Friday at the, for at least one more week anyway. I will be absent from the next meeting. Uh, I will be on St. Patrick's Day uh, uh, getting a, a new hip. So uh, hopefully I'll uh, be walking in better when I next you see me in a couple of weeks. But, uh, but that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bliss. Uh, yes, so uh, I also appreciate the, the city manager's efforts uh, for the <coughs> coronavirus and making sure that our city's prepared. Uh, it's really interesting we talk about preparedness. I, I went to the store and there was 
zero hand soap left. And it makes me wonder, like, were people not washing their hands before? Like, you didn't have any of that in your house. There's, there's no hand sanitizer anywhere. So, like, I, I appreciate that people are paying attention to it. And honestly, I never realized how often I touch my face until everyone said, don't touch your face. Um, but I think exercise caution, if you're sick, stay home. Uh, that's the directive in uh, City Hall as well. Uh, and so please just take the proper precautions, which by the way is why our mayor is not here tonight. Uh, mayor Hartwell is sick and he took that same advice and if he's sick, stay home. Uh, and so I, I would appreciate uh, some well wishes being sent his way. Uh, I know I do. Uh, hope he's better for the next meeting. Uh, though he, he missed an easy one, obviously. <laughs> 930. Uh, also, I, I really do appreciate everybody coming out and speaking tonight, and those who didn't speak, coming out and listening and participating. Uh, it means more than you know. Uh, and tomorrow is going to be an important day for those who are looking to participate. Uh, I'm sure our city clerk is really happy that we went in this, such a short time period in this meeting because I think you're preparing the absentee ballots and, and everything right after this meeting in this room, right? Yes. <laughs> so please, if you haven't already uh, voted, make, make sure you do that tomorrow. And uh, I believe we're accepting absentee ballots even tomorrow uh, for that new law from a year ago. That's it, Your Honor. Thank you, Mrs. Orbach. I am just going to quickly say thank you to Ms. Vita Palazzolo and um, um, uh, Crystal Beaver and all of those that came in today to uh, for MS Awareness Month. Um, I also know that you are hosting a uh, fundraiser for the Michigan chapter of Multiple, Multiple Sclerosis Society on Saturday, March 28th um, here at Cadillac Straits Brewing Company. And I encourage everyone to attend and to uh, participate in that. I am planning to be there, so see you there. Um, and uh, everybody knows that you can vote tomorrow. I also want to note that uh, anyone who's interested, there is a meeting of the Southeast Oakland Democratic Club, which is, includes the his cities of Hazel Park and Madison Heights. Um, they meet uh, every month. They alternate between Hazel Park and Madison Heights. And this Thursday, March 12th, is the one in Hazel Park at the Hazel Park Rec Center at <coughs> 7 p.m. for anybody who wants to attend. Um, and then finally, yesterday was International Women's Day, and I have a lot of wonderful women in my life. Um, I know all of us um, have at least one wonderful woman that we can um, thank, thank for our lives. But um, yesterday, uh, I just want to take this opportunity to thank all the women who have given their time and energy to grow and develop the city, unlike many other communities, both in this area and around the country. Madison Heights has had women in leadership since the very beginning, and I'm really thankful for that. Um, I'm thankful for all the people that have served the city and paved the way for myself and other women on council. Um, and I'm grateful to the women who had departments throughout this city, including our um, city manager, Ms. Melissa Marsh. She's amazing and a real inspiration to me. Um, and I want to also thank all the women who serve on boards and commissions in Madison Heights. You guys do amazing work, and your dedication to the people of this city is remarkable, and I thank you. That is all. Great. Thank you. Mr. Sherman. Well, I'm going to follow uh, Councilman Bliss's lead and send some uh, get well wishes to Mayor Hartwell and uh, to Councilman Corbett. I want to wish him a complete speedy recovery, so we'll see him back uh, at the council dais here sometime very soon. And, um, and I agree with, uh, with uh, Councilor Rohrbach's comments. I have plenty of wonderful women in my life, and if I didn't say anything about it, I might have problems at home. So, so I'm, I'm with you 100%. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Madam Mayor. There's no comment. Yes, tomorrow is election day, and I did see some election workers in here and do want to remind you that you have to be there at 6 a.m. <laughs> I am um, going to be here at 5 a.m. Um, it's going to be a long day, so I just want to, it's going to be a long day for everybody. All the people that volunteer to work the elections, please be kind to them. They're the ones that make it all happen for us so that we can have our democracy. Um, the polls will be open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. tomorrow. All voting locations in the city will be open. You, if you do have your absentee ballot still, you can turn that in tomorrow, um, anytime before the polls close. Please do not wait to 8 o'clock. 
because <laughs> we'd like to get our <laughs> results before that. I mean, as soon as possible after eight o'clock. Um, but you do technically have till eight o'clock at night to turn those in. Um, if you are a new voter and you have not registered to vote yet, we have a new law in the in the um, state of Michigan that will allow you, with your proof of residency, to come into the city clerk's office and register to vote. That same day so you can come see us at city hall if that is um, your situation and other than that thank you thank you mrs clark yes um i yesterday was international women's day as we know so i just wanted to give some props to my women here on city council um emily you ran on a campaign of planting trees and i'll be darned if you didn't get that done as soon as you got into office so great job on that uh, Melissa, you are legitimately the smartest woman that I know, and the city is so <laughs> lucky to, to have you on board. Uh, Cheryl, I want to thank you for everything you do, not only because you do a lot to hold the city together, but uh, you strongly encourage voting in our city. You make sure that the practice is held sacred, and you also make sure that every single vote counts, and I got to experience you testing those machines for this voting session. It was pretty exciting if you're nerdy about that stuff. Um, Rosalind, again, tremendous leadership uh, in the face of a crisis. I can't thank you enough for being by our side for that. Um, I also want to thank the Madison Action Forward team, which is head by a lot of strong, amazing women. <clears throat> I want to thank them for organizing and mobilizing Madison District families to ensure the best interests of the students and to hold their leadership accountable. Uh, I asked Beth Scott, a lot has changed in the past couple weeks uh, going on at the Madison School Board meetings, and I asked her to give me a couple of of words um, of how that is going, and she gave me these. Uh, community movement, action, accountability, transparency, self-expression, togetherness, attentive, memorable, proud, and pure love. Now, if you would ask her to give you a list of words a couple weeks ago, I'm sure they would have been mostly four-letter words, <laughs> and they would have expressed a lot of frustration. So there's a lot of growth happening in the Madison School District right now, and I'm excited about it. Uh, Vita Palazzolo, thank you for fighting the good fight, bringing together more Madison High School residents to let them know that they're not in this fight alone. I commend you for your positive action and for helping others in need, not just for MS, but for literally everything you can think of in the city. You're there on every, almost every single board and commission and doing fundraising. You're a saint. I love you very much. Thanks for bringing it to the table today. Um, I just wanted to address real quick uh, uh, our residents, Amy, Cindy, Johnette, who come out and brought about your concerns for uh, the locations of the medical marijuana facilities and potential recreational facilities. Um, for me tonight, approving the ordinance was a no-brainer. It wasn't hard for me. Uh, I thought that the map was in good, like, uh, in good consideration, and I thought that it should should move forward as such. But the major issue that I've been dealing with, um, and I know a lot of residents are dealing with, are the, uh, the caregiving facilities. My husband and I's business has grown a couple of times in the past few years, and we're now looking for yet another facility, and we've been looking in the downtown area, and it seems that every building that is avail like that we would think would be ideal or available to us is being swallowed up by the caregiver industry. And that's a big concern for me because it's all in the downtown district, all a district that we're trying to develop economically to be to build walkability and to put shops and markets and everything else in these buildings that have to remain locked and boarded up and secured at all times are taking up residence in this area and they're appearing as vacant buildings and they're destroying a lot of the opportunity that we have to grow. So I'd like to see us as city council come together uh, maybe with these caregiver, caregivers. I know that we're uh, bound by state law, but I think that there might be something that we we can develop together to address the concerns of the residents, to maybe build incentives to get these caregivers to get closer to these medical facilities, particularly as they start to grow and they're going to be needing more grow operations around them. I think if we keep the industry in one area, that they're all likely to be more successful for it. Um, so I just want you to know as city council, as we move into talking more about medical marijuana and recreational marijuana and what that's gonna look like in our city, I Personally, while I am a proponent for both medical and recreational, I voted, I voted in favor of both. I am not a proponent for them taking up every wonderful aspect of our city. I, I would like to see the areas of our city that are meant to grow and be developed for our residents grow, and I would love to see the marijuana industry flourish in an area where they can all help each other. Um, 
And then a lot of our residents brought up the fact of what happens over, over the course of the next couple of years, what happens in five years and everything changes. I wanna remind you that every single seat on this council is up for grabs over the course of the next five years. If it is not operating up to your standards, get out and vote and find someone who can do the job for you. We may not all be right, although I think we make a pretty good team, but you need to pay attention to that. And if stuff starts to go south, there are people in this city who are huge activists for the city who will be up here to support you in a heartbeat. That's all. Thank you. Mr. Soltis. Thank you. Uh, um, Miss, Madam Mayor, excuse me. Ms. And um, so I, I take a, kind of a different perspective on the, uh, the coronavirus. Uh, I've been in healthcare for about 17 years. Um, the first few years was in EMS, so I, I was a, <coughs> always exposed to active TB, uh, HIV, Hep C, you know, all the, those type of uh, situations. But I think what makes this one different now is, is because what I heard on NPR is the, um, that the virus is starting to mutate, uh, which can cause some problems. So I, I, I just say, you know, my advice is to take it seriously. Um, you know, remember what happened, um, I read up on the Spanish flu. I think that affected, uh, I think, 10 to 20% of the world population. Um, and, and so many fatalities as well. So I'm not saying this is gonna do that, but I just think uh, you know, we really need to take it seriously because uh, it could turn on us. And, uh, and I was also reading that uh, the reason to start is because they think that the bats in the caves were the ones that were carriers. And then they, um, I guess they bit um, or infected the, the hogs, the pigs. Mm -hmm. And so then they slaughtered the pigs and. Um, probably didn't have well sanitation or, or what have you, but then it started to spread that way, which, which is a good idea if you want to be a vegetarian. So I think, uh, I think everyone should look into that. But um, anyhow, it, just my advice is that just really take it seriously. Um, and even if it goes away, like the Spanish flu, it came back um, twofold or threefold uh, that the following spring. So um, you just have to watch out for it. And uh, please go out and vote tomorrow. Um, that's, your, uh, that's your right, and uh, take advantage of it. Thank you, that's all. Thank you, Mr. Soltis. Um, and yes, if you are a veget vegetarian, you do need to worry about E. coli. So there's always something out there that we need to worry about, but. Um, you get organic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also wanna wish Mr. Hartwell a speedy recovery, and Mr. Corbett, good luck with your surgery. We hope to see you only missing one meeting and back with us soon. Um, with respect to the coronavirus, uh, everything I'm reading is wash your hands. And uh, I mean, we should have been doing that anyway, so wash your hands. Um, I survived SARS 17 years ago. I was living in Toronto. I remember what was going on there, people in masks, all the panic, and I was on a crowded subway every day going to work, and I survived. So um, I think just use your common sense. Um, we have the uh, last meeting, we, we approved the unsolicited paper, newspaper ordinance, and I've already had complaints that people are receiving the newspapers. So what we're doing, I'm taking those complaints. If you have them, please send them to me, any member of council, the city manager, we're forwarding them on to um, our attorneys to see what we can do with those because they are now in violation. Um, best thing though is if you have a picture or a video or you catch a license plate or something, but uh, Mr. Corbett made this statement a couple of weeks ago that obviously if a newspaper is showing up on everybody's street, you know, it, it's the company that's doing it. So we do need to stay on top of it. Please let us know, give us your address, that kind of thing. And we need to know which paper it is because um, I've heard from multiple people about multiple papers. So we do need to know which one it is. Um, thank you to Vita and Crystal for bringing MS awareness to the city. If you do set up some kind of a support group, you know, please make sure that you let us know um, and we can help publicize that for you. And I um, also want to take a moment to recognize uh, International Women's Day. Uh, the first time I was ever interviewed about this, I was in high school and I was stopped on the street with a few of my high school friends and I said, I don't see why women have to March. I don't. I don't see the point in this. Just to prove that we're we're the same as men. We're not the same as men. We're different, but we're equal. And um, I I still feel that very much. Except that I think that we do seem to need to prove ourselves to people. And so I want to say thank you to Marjean Scott and to all the women who came before me. I know that you helped to pave the path for me. As I hope that I'm paving the path for those who are coming behind me. Um, 
I also want to say thank you to the men who support women. You know, some men are intimidated by strong women and they work to undermine them, but others choose to support them. So I would like to give thanks to my husband for his unwavering support. And I also want to thank my late father who always had faith in me. And God, Dad, if you could see me now. So on that note, everyone, please drive safely home, wash your hands, and remember tomorrow to vote. Meeting adjourned.